All right, welcome everybody. We're just going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining us tonight, whether you're here in the room in person or participating via Zoom. It's really good to see you this evening for this event that kicks off our year long 100th birthday celebration of the Columbia Public Library. Tonight's program, Founding Mothers, Establishing Library Services in Columbia, is co-sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Columbia Boone County. And we are pleased as always for our partnership, our ongoing partnership with that organization. My name is Lauren Williams. I'm Adult and Community Services Manager here at the Columbia Public Library. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Tim Dollins to talk to us tonight about the women involved in the earliest stages of establishing a library in this community. I do need to say a giant thank you, to, and I know he's going to thank them as well, Nina Sappington and Katie Ziegler for their research for this program, finding articles, documents, records, photos, and helping put together the slides um, and content and helping narrow down the scope for this presentation. We'll have more, more events to get to a lot of the other awesome information that um, they've discovered. Tim Dollins is a library associate and a three-term past president of the Genealogical Society of Boone County and Central Missouri, a two-term past president of the Missouri State Genealogical Association. And he's been doing uh, genealogical research for over 40 years, and he is very, very passionate about local history um, in general and the library specifically. So I wanna welcome Tim Dollins, come on up. First, I wanna thank everyone for coming. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, tonight's presentation is called Founding Mothers, Establishing Library Services in Columbia, 1899 to 19 and 22. And there's a quote here, there is no tax supported institution within my knowledge anywhere that gives so great a return on each dollar invested as does the public library. And this was a quote from the chairman of the Kansas City Public Library urging the mill tax um, in the 1917 um, quest for the local um, Columbia supporters to get a um, Carnegie building. And I'll talk more about that as we go through the slides, but I don't wanna tell you more now, but you'll have to just wait. So the very first time that there was a charter for a, the first, a Columbia Public Library was on in March of 1859. And um, the gentleman who started it, uh, called it the Columbia Library Association. And they even went so far as to get it put into the Missouri State Law of, eight, of March 14th, 1859 as the Columbia Library Association. And it was a subscription-based um, collection. And it was from prominent men incorporating this included David H. Hickman, Robert Levi Todd, R.B. Price, Thomas B. Gentry, Moss Pruitt, W.F. Switzler, C.C. Swallow and J.S. Rollins. And part of the reason this library was um, started was because Mr. Rollins, who had passed away, wanted to give donate his collection to what they wanted to be a Rollins Public Library for Columbia when he passed away in the, in, in, in earlier than that. Um, they did have a mission statement, the objects of which are, are the collection of a library, the mutual improvements of its members by lectures and oral discussions and dissemination of knowledge. Now, if you look at the picture here, you'll see there is um, what was then Academic Hall on fire on January 9th, 1892. It just so happens that the reason this connects is because the collection that these gentlemen had from 1859, clear up until the time they donated it to the University of Missouri Columbia, it was housed in Academic Hall. And of course, that whole collection burned in the fire of 1892. And that's why we have the picture here of Academic Hall on this picture. And then the women's clubs. And if you look on this slide, you'll first see the picture of the founder of General Federation of Women's Clubs. She was from Iowa and her name was Jane Cunningham Crawley or Jenny June. And um, the quote I'm going to give you is from the 50th anniversary of the Tuesday Club here in Columbia at their anniversary meeting, which was actually a candlelight vigil for the, 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 the members who had founded the organization. The scientific age was upon these women. A new era was opening to all women. Science, sports, literature were now new achievements. Some men in medicine were still decrying in participation in sports as being too strenuous for delicate women. But the inquisitive woman has always wanted the truth about many things. And thus, the Tuesday Club 
in Columbia, Missouri was founded on January 17th, 1899. And it was federated with the state uh, general federation of women's organizations in October of 1899. And then they joined the national organization in 1904. And their, um, their quote as their motto for their organization when they started was, quote, the object of the club shall be to promote philanthropic and intellectual advancement, end quote. Um, a quote from the 1932 um, Columbia Missourian says it all about the Tuesday Club and its history. The Tuesday Club discusses everything. One is apt to hear a discussion on what to do with local backdoor tramps or an exchange of opinions on the heating value of the city's gas or an investigation of illiteracy in Missouri. When one drops in at one of their meetings, no civic problem is too small for their consideration, nor any state or national problem too large. Now on your left, you'll see the club's flower is a pink carnation. But this, having said this, um, the, the organization when it started, they really wanted to emphasize um, a library for the youth of Columbia. That was one of their first initiatives. And we'll go more into that later, but it was really one of the first things they did after they formed their organization in January. Um, their club volunteers actually ran the reading room um, on Saturday afternoons. And then eventually they added uh, Mondays in 1900 when they were able to hire their very first uh, paid librarian. Um, the city librarian um, over the years was a complimentary member and on the executive board. And part of this was because um, in the earlier years when the Tuesday Club was financing the library um, room, as it was, um, the city government and the Columbia Public Schools would often give monies to help them pay their bills for the things they needed um, throughout the year. Um, members gave lectures on a variety of topics, including art, history, music, philosophy, and social issues. And then they used the word social culture. And so, and we'll go more into that later. This is the home of W.W. W. Garth, built in 1834, but it was also the scene for the very first Tuesday Club meeting in January of 1899. This home is located um, at 10 Hit Street on the corner of Hit and Cherry. And right now it is the parking lot um, south of the Presbyterian Church across from 7-Eleven. So get an idea, but you see the rather why the home, the home is no longer here. It was built in 1834. And you notice the name Garth. Now we're gonna talk about the original Tuesday Club officers because if you're gonna talk about the ladies who are the founding mothers of our library organization from 1899, you need to talk about the ladies who stepped up and took a role as being the officers. And I'm gonna read their names here and I'm gonna go have a slide for each one of them as we go along. Um, Libby Edmondstone Tom Thompson was the pres pres president, and then Eva Johnston uh, was vice president and history chair. Luella Wilcox St. Clair Moss was vice president and art chair. Clara Field Thompson Jones was vice president um, and music chair. Bessie Allen Johnson was recording secretary. Verna Evangeline Sheldon Hicks was corresponding secretary. Marion or Mamie Elvira Deering was the treasurer. Emma Price Willis was on the executive board and as was Francis or Fanny Lawson. Um, and then um, later in the year in November, Camilla Sw Switzler Branham became the president in November, 1899. And if you look at this picture to the right, you'll see a picture of uh, Camilla Branham serving tea to Luella St. Clair Moss. Um, and this was more than likely at one of their meetings, or it could have been one of their suffrage meetings. We don't know which, but we just know that these are two of our founding mothers of the library. Um, and this is typical of a party they would have or the meeting would have, they would have tea and cakes. So other library founders is found in 1920 version of the, of the Evening Missourian include Betty and Matilda or T.D. Todd. Um, and the reason they're, um, these people on this list are important is because um, uh, as I read through the information, you'll understand why. These two ladies were early female graduates of the Missouri University. And they were daughters of Robert L. Todd, who was also an early university graduate. And of course, Robert L. Todd was a local man who was um, prominent in town as well. Betty never married and was a missionary. Um, and for over 40 years, she ran what they called the industrial school, um, which basically from the school year, 
all the young girls um, in school from ages four to 13 were um, on Saturdays would go to a, the Presbyterian church that was sponsored by the three churches in town and actually learn how to sew, cook, quilt, and everything a young lady at that time needed to do to be a proper young lady. And she did, she helped these ladies do this for 40 years in this three church um, community. Her sister, Titi, Titi, whose real name was Matilda, she was a professor and she moved later moved out to um, California to be with another sister to help raise her family. And of course, Robert Todd died out in California as well. These ladies were both early Tuesday Club members and TD was often giving programs for the Tuesday Club on the four areas we talked about on culture and um, um, et cetera. Uh, Jessie Matthews was a local girl who was also the granddaughter of um, local prominent people. And she married a professor, Frank C. Tilly, who went on to be a professor at Cornell University. And even after she moved back east to Cornell in Ithaca, New York, she was, she became the president of the City Federation of Women's Clubs there. She was also big in the temperance movement in the, in the 20s and 30s. And again, uh, she was an early Tuesday Club member. And then another woman who's mentioned in this 1922 article is a woman by the name of Sarah Elizabeth Crouch, wife of Edward W. Crouch. And Sarah just happens to be um, the, um, part of the reason she's in town on the social scene is that her husband is the local lumberman and then mercantile. And so her being part of the social scene, she was very adamant. She was very strong about taking care of the poor. And the Society for the Poor in Columbia was one of the first clubs organized that the women in town started in the 1860s and 70s. And then she was also big on um, Boy Scouts as well. Um, we have one gentleman on this list named Ernest Lyman Mitchell. And Ernest Lyman Mitchell was, um, he started his career out in Columbia. He was like a third generation family. Um, from a prominent family here that ran real estate and insurance. And later he became the founder of the Columbia Daily Tribune in 1901. He found his passion. Unfortunately, in 1905 in November, he died after an eight week battle of typhoid fever. Um, to the right, you'll see a picture of the Whittle Building on Broadway. And we believe that is actually one of the first uh, buildings that the library was housed in in its first few years when it was here. So now let's talk about the ladies we talked about earlier that were the, the founding mothers. The first one is Elizabeth Libby Edmondstone Thompson, 1842 to 1932. Her actual first name was Mary, and she was the first president of the Tuesday Club. And shortly, obviously, she was um, in November, she um, it was taken over by, by Camilla. But Elizabeth or Libby was not, is still the honorary um, for life uh, president of the club. Born in Vandalia, Illinois, she married to a gentleman by the name of Thomas J. Thompson. They were married in 1866 and had two young children. Uh, one was Clara, um, and we'll talk about her later, and one was Burton. And her husband died in 1870. And we believe that she moved to Columbia in 1880 for her daughter to come to college here. We don't know why, but she was a widow in 1870 when her husband died, but she was here in 1880 in Columbia. Um, and she was one of the first graduates at Lindenwood College in St. Charles. And that's then you see the picture there. And she also attended Science Hall in Shelbyville, Kentucky. Um, clearly, she had some kind of financial means. And clearly, women of that day would have gone to a two-year college in their late teens, 17 to 19 to 20. Um, when she passed away, a quote on, in the Tribune, a long and useful life characterized by continuous well-doing, altruism, and unselfish devotion to her family. Next, we have Camilla Price Switzler Branham, 1856 to 1913. She was the second president of the Tuesday Club, active in the DAR, and she was also active in the suffrages movement. As were, and in fact, a lot of these ladies in this organization were active in the DAR. It was one of the premier groups to be in in town. Uh, she was married to J.S. Branham, a local merchant in town and from a prominent family. And she also, um, was a graduate of Christian College in 1874, and she was president of the Alumni Association for several years. Um, a quote about her, she was dynamic but gracious, vigorous but tactful. And as I said, she was, she's often thought as the first president of the organization, but she didn't assume the position until November of 1999. And we're thankful that the State Historic Society of Missouri had several of these photos of these, um, these founding ladies. 
Luella Wilcox St. Clair Moss, 1865-1947. Someone, when she was running for um, an office, a public office, uh, that she was characterized as a steam engine in petticoats. Um, and that's just, and that doesn't even say enough about her. I could do a whole talk on Luella. Um, president of the Columbia Christian College, um, after her husband died, um, and she came here and um, she also, um, she did it for a few years and then she left to go back to another college and then she came back and then she stayed. Even though she had offers from other, from other colleges, her alma mater's in Kentucky, she said, no, I'm staying in Columbia. And she took the college um, from being the Christian college to Columbia College, but she took it from a $30,000 um, worth to a 274,000 worth in just 20 some years of her, her alone and her being the president. Uh, she was a charter member of the Tuesday Club as we just saw, and she was a vice president of the Columbia Equal Suffrage Association. And we'll talk more about that later. She was the president of the League of Women Voters, which is the name of the, the new name of what the Columbia Equal Suffrage Association was. And she was the president of that from 1925, 1957. She was president of MLA and she was the first woman to do that. She ran for Congress in 1922 and had strong support in Boone County and surrounding areas. And she got the Democratic nomination in the primary, but she did not win. However, she did become the very first um, elected school board member for the Columbia Public Schools. And that's not even close to the, all the accolades that she has um, throughout the world. Um, with her, with her um, legacy of all the things she did. She had one child that um, named Annalie that died young and um, had no other children. And she later was married to a Mr. Moss in town, also a very well-known family um, after, um, you know, and in a few years after her husband died, but she stayed in town and she was a supporter of, of everyone's rights, equal rights for everybody, not just women. Now, Emily S. Harsh, 1857 to 1930. Um, this woman here is special um, because if there is a mother of the Columbia Public Library, both the one we have then and the one we have now, it would be none other than Emily S. Harsh. She was the one person, one of two or three ladies that actually was in it from the beginning until what we have today, what, what's till her children's death in 1930, 10 years, or eight years after we have the tax-based library. If you look to the right, you'll see a picture of the ad of her husband's bookstore. Her husband was William Edgar Harsh and they owned the local bookstore in town. And she not only ran it in retirement, she was also his bookkeeper when, when he was alive. <laughs> so she was, and she wasn't from here. She wasn't from here, but she stayed here, but she's buried um, up in her hometown area near Macon. Um, she served as the first director of the Tuesday Club in 1899. And so even though she wasn't an officer, she was a director. And so they had directors who did certain topics each month for the nine months out of the year that they were in, they usually worked from April, um, from September through April, they had the summers off because, you know, people traveled and then the school year. She was instrumental in getting the 1922 tax levy passed for the Columbia Public Library. And she did run for the Columbia Committee Woman in 1922. Um, but her, um, and she was also a state delegate for the National Democratic Convention in 1924. But the reason she's special to our library is that, um, when the Tuesday Club wanted to give up operating the library venture that they had started, that, that was their baby, um, they decided to have a community council and she was, became the president of that community council. And she was well revered to the point that they wrote a nice um, tribute to her in, this, in, this, in, the, in the library's minutes about how she truly is the mother of um, our library um, as we know it today. Dr. Eva Johnston. 1865-1941. Born in Ashland, Missouri to a prominent um, mercantile and um, minister family. She was a graduate of Stevens College in 1882. She was a University of Missouri graduate in 1895. And she's the first woman um, at the university to get a full-time professorship at the Missouri University. That's what they called it then, Missouri University, just so you know. And they actually gave her a two-year hiatus from 1903 to 1905 to go study in Germany, where she got another degree um, in Germany. Um, she was also the Dean of Women in 1922. 
And everything that touched women's lives on campus, she was a part of. If you, if you, if you don't know anything about the early part of the MU um, life, you're going to find out that she's the person that was, had something to do with it. Again, you saw where she was one of the first club members. MU Johnson's Hall is named in her honor. And this is a picture of her. And then there was a similar picture of this um, in the paper when she passed away. But she's very prominent in this um, organization, as well as suffrage, by the way. It wasn't just, um, she was a part of suffrage as well very active. Clara Field Thompson Jones. She was a member of the Tuesday Club, the Fortnightly Club, which is also a club that's also um, a local club affiliated with the GFVW, the General Federation of Women's um, um, Clubs. And she was a founder of the University Glee Club. She was married to Dr. John Carlton Jones, a University of Latin professor, uh, who, who then became the Dean of Colleges and Arts and Sciences, and then later became university president. And of course, she studied Latin under him. And of course, if you'll see right down below, she was the daughter of Libby Edmondstone Thompson, born in St. Louis and came here in 1880. Um, she was very prominent in the Columbia social scene, being a hostess. And she had all kinds of parties for all kinds of the ladies and the social people in this town. But she is the lady that went to the 1898 General Federations of Women's Organization in St. Louis and came back to Columbia and said, we have to start a club here, the Tuesday Club. And she is our true woman that helped. And of course, she had her mother become the president and she became um, one, of the, one of the presidents. And on the right, you'll see an article where she is actually taking young women from the university to go in the summer and to see the culture and the history of other parts of the world, not just their own world. And so all these women in town, she would take trips with these women to teach them about other cultures and about the about life. Um, another member of the, the officers was Verna Evangeline Sheldon Hicks, 1863-1962. Yes, she died at age 99, a long, useful life. She was the first Tuesday Club corresponding secretary when it opened up and it started in January of 1899. Active in the fundraising that they started, which was um, a book, uh, there was a book. Um, well, first there was a Valentine's Day dance um, in, in February after they started in January. And then in March, there was a, a book donation time and she showed many of her books. And um, she studied art at Wellesley College and graduated in 1885. And to the right, you'll see a picture of Wellesley College, uh, perhaps one of the buildings she might've walked in when she was there. Um, she was married to a local professor, Frederick C. Hicks, was a university professor from 1892 to 1900 here on, and, and he was an economics faculty who established the Indian Department of History and Political Economy. And um, they moved to Cincinnati, Ohio in 1900, which is also one of her alma maters. And they stayed there throughout the rest of his career until his death. And he actually became the president of the college from 1920 to 1929. And she was very active in all the things about the university when he was president and on until you know later in life. But she was only here briefly for the first year, but she was one of these ladies who, was very active in everything they did until the time she moved um, a year and a half later. Bessie Allen Johnson, one of their other members who was um, 1861, 1933, who was also one of the members of the club that was an um, officer. Um, she was recording secretary and she was also active in the Columbia chapter of the League of Women Voters. And her husband was a local um, traveling salesman for the Mayfield Company, Adolf or Adolf Adolphus S. Johnson. And um, her claim to fame here locally, besides um, her charity work and the library and volunteering for the um, library, is that she lobbied the legislature to build Parker Memorial Hospital, which is still standing on the campus, uh, named for Mr. Parker, who was a local um, businessman who put the money up for it. But it became the teaching hospital for what we now have as the MU um, um, Hospital. So that's her claim to fame and the, is the Parker Hospital on MU campus. And this was, this was, we're talking 20 years before they built Boone County Hospital after the um, pandemic or the, 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 um, the influenza um, of 1918. She was a lifelong member of the Christian church and her organization promoted the library's um, tax levies every time it came up uh, very, very prominently. And she was a very active member of the Tuesday Club. We then get to Marion or Mamie Elvira Matthews Deering. 1855 to 1914. 
She was our first treasurer of the Tuesday Club and later became the club president, but she always kept the books until the day she died in, 19, in August 1914. She was a lifelong member of the Methodist Church. Uh, also, which is what, what the, the Women's Club and the Methodist Church always had ads in the paper to promote the library tax levies 1917 and 1922. And when her, um, her, her husband here in town, when she was here in 1880, he was the local undertaker and he later went out west and we believe they divorced. We're pretty sure they divorced and she stayed here and she ran a uh, boarding house in the Beasley Academy and helped raise her children. And all three of her children um, became, you know, graduated from, the, from local colleges here. One became the um, um, prime minister of Portugal and the other one became a, um, a um, another person prominent in, um, in the government. Emma B. Price Willis, 1858 to 1942. She too was a, stu a student at Stevens College, um, early Tuesday Club member, uh, founder of the Red Cross here, local, or I'm sorry, fundraiser for the Red Cross, a philanthropist and a socialite, and that's just putting it mildly. If you see the name Price right there, you know she's from the Price family who were the bankers in town of Boone County National Bank. Well, she was from that family and with that family becomes the prestige of that. And that's one of the longest running businesses in town still today. And her father, believe, even though he was a banker, he was also a, um, Mr. Price was also a, um, an artist. And some of the, and so when I was doing research on her, I found out that she actually had in her home in the 1920s, she had four of his original drawings of downtown Columbia that are just, just priceless if we'd never find them. But she, collect, she collected art and she was also and always willing to um, run the social aspects of the clubs and to support the library. A personality whose dignity and poise inspired su superlative respect was written about her in 1942 when she passed away. Now, bear in mind that a lot of these ladies that were running the um, Tuesday Club and in the Tuesday Club, besides being prominent women on the social scene, they often used their own monies to make ends meet for the library because they wanted children to have access to books and materials. Um, the Tuesday Club, um, they called it the Columbia Free Library, by the way, most times, although it's been interposed with both things. But they were always in need of cash and donations, and they were always asking members to pay. Um, the, uh, they would have literary readings. Um, they would actually have flower shows. And actually, our library, even today, is credited with having the first flower show for the state of Missouri, um, um, in, in Missouri. So Benny Boone has a claim for that. Um, the library was briefly closed in 1905 due to lack of funds. And there was a not, a not so nice, there was, a, there was a nice article in the paper saying that the town should be funding this. We should not, they shouldn't have to. I do wanna mention that um, in 1900, they, they hired their very first uh, librarian named Louise Kurtz. And she did a play called Escape from Sing Sing and raised $24.14. Now remember that amount. Um, the other thing is you see the two books on the, to the right. These were two of the books that would have been on the shelves of our library because people were donating their own collections to make this book available. These, and so people would donate their own copies. This is what books would look like on our shelves in that library room, which would be half the size of this room. So we, now let's get to our first librarian. Another, again, one of our founding, um, the, uh, mothers of the library that we know today. Her name was Louise Lenore Kurtz uh, at birth, and they called her Lula. And I think the Lula comes from Louise and Lenore Lula. And um, she, was, she was born here in Columbia in 1879 to a large family of four boys and two girls to a Daniel Webster um, Kurtz, who was a local farmer turned professor. And Lulu, Lula was an 1898 graduate of the female college, and she was an elocutionist, which means she taught people how to talk and how to, how to be in, in, to be in um, drama. And she worked for the Columbia Normal Academy after graduating. Um, and this is a picture of the Columbia um, Normal Academy, which would be um, downtown just off, uh, just off Broadway um, on, I believe, Cherry Street. But it was built here and she worked there for a few years um, as a elocutionist. So the library paid her um, $48 in 1900. 
And you know, she made $24.14 of her salary doing a play. Now her play was very well received and it was done in the Hayden Opera House. And it went to the towns of Boonville and um, Ashland. It was very well received. But again, her, her um, and then she went on to, um, she never joined the society, but she went on out West and her claim to fame besides um, this in her short life, as you see, she died in 1918. Um, she, um, educate, uh, physical education, or they called it physical culture, was the rave for, for children to have physical, um, be able to, you know, have physical, we call it physical education, but they called it physical um, uh, culture then. And she was one of the first people to, um, her sister had moved, married and moved to Coffeeville, Kansas in the teens. And she went out there in the summer and she wrote a grant and got a grant to build playground equipment for their schools in Coffeeville, Kansas. And it was reported so heavily, it was all over the papers because she was so, doing so good at it. She later moved to um, Seattle, Washington and married her husband, um, who was a architect named Harold Chalfant. Um, they had two children. The first child was a boy and it died shortly after birth. And then three years later, she had another baby um, girl. And um, the day of the baby's birth, Lula died and then the baby died two days later. And she and her baby, her second baby are buried here in the Columbia Cemetery um, in the family plot of the Kurtz family. But again, you see how much the expenditures were um, for, the, for the, just that one year. And um, by the way, she, she, she produced this report for the library and they published it in the local paper so they'd know how much it costs to run a library for free. So it was $161.67 for in 1900 to run the library, the first full year. And it, that was because it started in April of 1899. And so the first full year, 161.67. And her salary was $48 for the whole year. Um, and to the right, you see the, the, the Columbia Normal Academy. The reason we put a picture of this is because we can't locate a copy of a picture of Lula. And um, however, when she did the play, all the actors in the play, um, which we have the names of all of them, except for her brother and one other were all her students at the Columbia Normal Academy. So we owe a tribute to her and her students to raise some money for a local cause. Our next most well-known librarian in the era of um, the first Columbia Free Library is Leela Bell Willis, 1864 to 1948. She was, she was a paid librarian from 1901 to 1904, and then again from 1913 to 1921. She was paid ten dollars per month. However, her salary before she retired was in, was in the uh, was uh, at least eighty dollars a month. Um, but the library had expanded hours, and then she finally got help uh, back when in the twenties. But in nineteen twelve, uh, they had two thousand books, and they expanded the juvenile holdings. And then, then she was the one that introduced um, children's story time in nineteen nineteen, and she um, she had a university student named Pauline Alsberg um, do that story time. And she loved the children. And by this time, the library had uh, moved from one of the shops downtown. In 1909, it moved to the courthouse in a, in a jury room, which wasn't very big. But um, a, a quote she has about, because she loved the children, and she was, always being, um, she was always being interviewed by the press. And there was two or three newspapers in town. We must keep the children supplied with new books or they will stop coming for them. Children and high school students are frequent patrons. So are the country people. Of course, we have all classes and all ages of readers, but our little library serves a lot of people whom the university library does not reach. And that was 1914 when they were trying to start their campaign for a Carnegie. Now, bear in mind, other towns around here all had Carnegie's because they were willing to pay the fee to get a Carnegie library. Um, and this here's a picture of the interior of that jury room. And some people were concerned because kids could hear some of the um, court proceedings when they were actually open the, the couple of days they were open. But Saturday mornings was a pretty, or Saturdays were pretty busy for the library, like nonstop from the time they were open to the time they're closed. Another early librarian was the one by the name of Esther Matilda Weatherall McGill, 1866 to 1935. She was our city librarian for just two years, 1911 to 1912. And the circulation doubled from 2,200 plus books to 5,800 in these years. She knew most of the children by names or interests. And at the Tuesday Club, she didn't join until later, but she was actually quoted as being kind of pessimistic about equal suffrage um, in 1911. Um, she herself was born in Chicago. She was a divorced woman and um, from her husband, George McGill, but she was from a prominent 
Her father was a prominent businessman in Chicago who retired in Florida. But she, along with her four children, came to Columbia from Michigan, where she ran a boarding house. And then she came here and she lived on Hudson Avenue. And she was known that because people had fines, because the library was only open for a couple hours a week, she wanted people to know that they can come by her house and pay their fines. <laughs> and so this, you know, there's a quote here that says, the persons who have books out and fail to return them are not at all those you would expect, said Mrs. McGill yesterday. There is one university professor who left Columbia last fall. He had several of the books out and did not return them. I have written him, but he has failed to send them back. All those who do not send book, books to the library by Saturday will have to pay the cost of the books they have out. This is in 1911. So she was very, um, she was very stern about her want for the books to be returned and it was put in the paper. Uh, now we get to the era of the Columbia Equal Suffrage Association. And it just so happens that a lot of the ladies from the Tuesday Club are also women who are part of the Columbia Equal Suffrage Association, which later became the League of Women Voters um, um, in 1919. But they started a campaign in 19 and 12 and they started getting a petition out in November thinking that it was going to pass, um, that Missouri was going to pass overall. Unfortunately, it did not. Um, they had an appeal to the legislature um, in 1919. Um, and one of the quotes from the Missouri from 1914 from Helen Miller, who was the uh, leader of this organization, um, and she's more often known as Mrs. Um, Walter McNabb Miller, um, but her quote in the Missouri in 1914 was, we are going to educate our women in civil government. We want them to know how to vote, why they should vote, and then to make use of that privilege. Um, equal suffrage is no man question. It is no woman question. It is a question of humanity. And that's also from 1914. So um, Mrs. McNabb, uh, Walter McNabb Miller or Helen, I mean, back then women used their husband's um, names to be called in, in a public setting, uh, but we know her as Helen, but she was one of our movers. She was the mover and shaker about the local, about suffrage. And I'll talk more about her later and her dealings. Uh, but she also was a, she also was a member of the Tuesday club and an active um, um, pursuer of children having access to books and materials and uh, to have culture. Now, Rosa Russell Ingalls, 1859 to 1939, is another member of the Tuesday Club when she started in 1905. She wasn't a founding member, but she started in 1905 and she was on the library committee in 1916. And she too is one of the women that until the day she died, she was instrumental in library services for the children here. But she was a frequent lecturer on women's social movements and their rights. And um, you see in 1912, she was the president of the Columbia Equal Suffrage Association, um, which um, charter members of the League of Women Voters um, and that's the name of it was before, as I said before. And she made her first talk in Columbia on the subject of women's suffrage to members of the Tuesday Club in March of 1912. So you know that of all the subjects in the world, whether it's religion or culture or art, women's suffrage was top on her list. But she was also a member of both groups too. And you see right here in 1920, um, she's talking about um, uh, have, being help, help, helping host the League of Women Voters Luncheon. And she was often a speaker at what was now the, the Commercial Club, which now we call the district. Um, but the Commercial Club was the local business business association, which finally let women in. But she would often be a speaker on topics that related to the community. And that's why she, but she was also always an advocate for the library up until the day she died as well. Now here's more about Helen Guthrie Miller. 1861 to 1949. Um, she actually began the Missouri Equal Suffrage Association and she was their first president and was actually headquartered in Columbia, Missouri. So you think of St. Louis and Kansas City being maybe the hubs for Missouri's Equal Suffrage Association? No, Columbia, Missouri. And she was the person who started it. And in 1914, she was quoted as saying, win, of course we'll win. Well, unfortunately at that time we did not. Um, she was married to Walter McNabb Miller, who was a university biology professor. And um, she too was um, going to all these uh, conferences for the GFWC. And she too was on various, um, both state and national boards um, and charities. And one of her claim to fame besides suffrage, which is her main claim, is um, food safety. She was very good on, very big on food safety. And a quote about her is that, kindly resourceful and with unlimited energy. 
Now we get to Ella Victoria Dobbs, 1866 to 1952. She too was a Tuesday Club member early on and of the Columbia Equal Suffrage Association and League of Women Voters. And she was their president from 1923 to 1924. She was also the first woman in town to run as a candidate for the Columbia School Board. She did not win, but she, was, she ran. She was assistant professor of the industrial arts and she donated 14 volumes of Little People Everywhere series to the public library. At least that we found a quote about that besides coming to a lot of the meetings and doing programs. And she was also the vice president of what the community council, which was the club that took over the Tuesday club to be the organization that started what we know now as the tax-based library today from 1922. And just a little sideline, I found an article about her on the industrial arts. So imagine she's teaching 20 women at the university and they're, she, she's teaching these women how to be nursery and elementary teachers. And so she's making all these, she's having all these young women, these 20 to build, don't build a house that you wanna live in, build a house of a different culture and a different area of the world. And what she did was, so someone was building an igloo, someone was building a mud house, someone was building a sod house, someone was building a mansion. And what she did is she was having them build these models so they could all learn about different cultures of the world and how different the world is in industrial arts. But because she was applied arts, she had to build these miniatures of these. I think it's very fascinating being, a, being an architecture des uh, design major myself. But I just think it's kind of cool that she was doing that. And um, she was clearly one of the women in, in, um, in town that was forming the lives of the women who came to the University of Missouri Columbia as a professor. Uh, one of the quotes about her is, it is not the aim of women merely to swell the number of votes cast. It is time that women began to think seriously of legislation that directly concerns women. And that was in 1920 in the Missourian. She was also big on um, illiteracy, or illiteracy. And you see there's a picture of her right there at one of her meetings. And that's, again, that's a collection from the State Historic Society of Missouri. Now we get to Vassie James Hill, 1875 to 1954. Now she's also a member of the Tuesday Club, but not only because she wasn't living here, but she was here in the time when they were operating the library as a, um, uh, the Columbia Free Library ran with the Tuesday Club. She was also for a Columbia Equal Suffrage Association and Missouri uh, League of Women Voters. She was first married to a Hugh C. Ward, out of, uh, as in Ward Parkway in Kansas City, and later married Dr. Albert Ross Hill, who was the university president. Um, they were married up in Michigan, but that was her second husband. And um, she attended Vassar College in 1894, and she founded many schools in her native town of Kansas City, and she was very well known. In fact, this picture is from the Kansas City Star when she passed away in 19... Uh, in, um, um, when she got married in 1919 to Mr. Hill, but that was a picture of her um, uh, getting ready to be married to the president of the university. But again, she had, besides being a social person with the social circle of the university, she also in her own rights was on the social scene of Kansas City. And she brought all that knowledge and that stuff to Columbia as well. And she was recruited for the Red Cross Foreign Services in 1918 during World War I and of course um, the influenza epidemic. But very highly respected woman in town, um, and then she ended up dying in 1954 in uh, Kansas City. Now, let's get on to the campaign for a Carnegie Library building, 1914 to 1917. So we already know all the ladies that were here working on the library. Now let's understand what was going on. So the Civic League and the PEO and the Tuesday Club and the suffrages were all soliciting a petition to get, get people to be able to vote in 1917 for, the right, uh, for, for a Carnegie building. Uh, Mrs. Louise W.T. Stevenson, who's also a member of the local Tuesday Club and the Suffrage Club, and also a um, um, prominent woman in town. And Mrs. Harshi led the effort. Again, you see Mrs. Harshi here. That's why she's one of the more prominent women of our organization. Uh, they knew the space in the courthouse was inefficient, and there was long waiting times. And you see Mrs. Harshi quoting, we have 145 in the Treasury now, and we want 10,000. Mrs. Harshi speaking before the MLA. October of 1916. She was actually going to the Missouri Library Association meetings. Um, she was pro-library on, on, and distributed to children um, cards to give to the fathers. And the reason she had cards given to the fathers is because women could not vote. They had only men could for the 
um, for this issue in 19 in, in 1914. Um, and the newspaper, are, um, she was also instrumental in helping to get some of the newspaper editorials and getting information out to the local um, church pastors to talk about it and then canvassing to get, because she couldn't vote herself, she wanted to get canvassing done to help people to pass the vote. And um, the women were actually calling people the night before and then the women um, trying to get this to pass in 1917 were also um, literally standing at the end of where the polling locations were to tell men to please vote for this. We need this in this town, the kids deserve it. And of course, here's a quote from the 1917 uh, Missourian. The university library does not fill the need. Taxpayers owe a library to their children. It is a necessary part of the school system. It is a university for the masses. Many persons spend more for tobacco in one month than they would, ha would have to pay for the library in a year. <laughs> Talk about reality. This is a great ad we found in the paper um, that talked about the library. And of course, um, Columbia was known as being the Athens of Missouri. And so they were saying, well, why are we the Athens of Missouri? We don't have a public library for our children. Well, we had three major colleges, you know, one for, one for Baptist women, one for Christian women, and one for, and, and then a university for both men and women, all within a close proximity. Um, and so we have this big ad here. And so there was a part of the, part of the, um, this ad was, it, it mentions that not necessarily a Carnegie library, because there was a faction of people who wanted us to build a library and were for it, but did not want a Carnegie because they did not want Mr. Carnegie's name on it. And um, you see where it says advertisement paid for by a committee of Columbia citizens. So one of the people in this picture you see is a, is a local man by the name of J.W. Schwabe. Um, if the people of Columbia want a pot library, they will build it with their own money. And that's him talking about the fact that um, he was from the commercial club. And it just so happens that um, he was one of the ones that was not wanting the Carnegie name on it. And he thought that Columbia could build their own and being a part of the commercial club, which is the businessman in town. But him being a businessman in town, he was a third or fourth generation Columbian. And he was the only, at the time of this, up until the time he died, uh, uh, 20 years after this, uh, in, um, he was the only Republican ever voted into office in Boone County. <laughs> he was the only Republican but he was well-known family and he was a Republican, which this time was mostly Democratic at the time. To the right, you'll see a picture of the Sedalia Carnegie Library that they got built years before we did. And I think it's, when we've gone through some of the history, it's ironic that the, um, the Mexico Public Library came and helped us catalog our collection. Isn't that ironic? Now, I will, I have some, I have some, some flag comments about Carnegie buildings. I'm glad that the libraries had them, but in some towns, I think the Carnegie has stifled some towns and their library services. And I think that we might've been saved by not having a Carnegie. Um, we had to wait for it. And some women had to work hard for it, but we did finally succeed. Now, the 1970 library was rejected, obviously, in April, 1917. It was a narrow loss of 470 and 606 against. And again, this is because women didn't have a right to vote. If women had been right to vote, it would have passed you know, with a lot more, a lot more, um, it would have definitely passed. Um, and then the picture you saw of Mr. J.D. Schwab or Schwabi, his um, quote is, women's organizations have wheedled and hoodwinked the voters. <laughs> that was his quote. We thought that was kind of funny when we found that in the articles in the paper. And you see that they, the, the, the people voted for the, the tax levy and the school levy pretty evenly, except for about, 50, about maybe 50 or 60 votes. And the, the only ward that did not pass it was the first ward. So um, then we get on to the fact that the library was getting out in two closer quarters and it's moving to the guitar building. And it was in the, it was in the courthouse in 1909 when they built a brand new courthouse because they had space. And I don't know if you all know about courthouse space in a courthouse just historically, but also superintendent of all the public school, the county schools. So besides having the public library and the jury room that they allowed them to have because we needed space, um, there was, and there was also a, prior to this, about, about 10 years before this went on, there was also a, um, a bill that did not pass in the legislature of the state that the theory was that most libraries need to be county libraries, not city libraries, because they would always take care of the whole county, not just the city. And they would always thrive because they had the money from every landowner for the taxes to support everyone in that county. And even though that wasn't, that's not the way the Carnegie 
thing was presented to most towns. And that's why you see those issues coming up. Um, but that was a thing for, that the state was trying to get passage of a, a have libraries by county. And of course the county courthouse was great because they, they allowed them to use that space because they didn't have room, they didn't need, they built a brand new building that wasn't full. So they used it for 10 years. And of course, you know, it's crowded. And then in 1919, on November 14th, they moved to across the street to the guitar building. And um, the, if you see the picture of the guitar building on the right, right where you see the top of the old car, the very northeast corner of that building, the, the building actually faces um, 8th Street, every the columns, but the street going um, where the car is headed in the direction of the car, that's um, Walnut Street. In the northeast corner of that building on the, on the ground level, right from where that little car is, was actually the library's office space. It was vacated by the um, City Power and Light Company who had moved over to Moore's Boulevard, which is where we have the smokestacks. So because they were vacating that spot, the city allowed the library to go there because again, the city and the schools were actually helping the Tuesday Club fund the differences in the monies they needed to run it by the volunteers. So um, it, you see where it says readers annoyed by juries? Well, that's because they didn't want people to be, um, they couldn't read in the library because they were hearing cases next door. Um, let's see, there are only 3,000 books in the city library, yet there are 2,500 names on the list of people who will take books out. This is 1918. We're talking 20 years after they're at a library. That's, that's incredible. All right, then we get to the Columbia Library Association. Now, why ironically, the Columbia Library Association was started in 1859 as the Columbia Library Association with a bill, with a, with a law in Columbia, in, in the state of Missouri. Well, now they call it again, the Columbia Library Association. And it becomes a part of the community council because the Tuesday Club wants to give up the uh, governance of it. And you see uh, Dr. Jesse Wrench, um, Emily Harsh, and Ella Dobbs are the three main members who are become part of the community council. And what they did was that every club in town, every civic club in town was responsible to have a person be a member of the community council and to be a, have an alternate. So every meeting they had about the library being, in, be, being progressed and moving forward had to have the person attend the meetings. And of course, Emily Marsh became the first president and Nella Dobbs was the first vice president of that organization. And if you see all these articles in the paper, you see where they're trying to move up the um, building. And then of course, um, 1922 is when women first have the right to vote in the primary in August, and they happen to also vote for the tax levy. And so now we get to the half mill tax campaign. And so now we're talking about people writing letters and how the, the half mill tax is needed to grow the library in March before the, um, the vote. And there's just all kinds of positive articles about it. Of course, the women got a chance to vote for the very, um, um, we're gonna got to vote as well. And so therefore, um, in August, and so therefore it passed. I'm sorry, it was voted on in, in March, but um, the half mill tax did pass um, in 1922. And that's why we have a tax-based library. And that's why we're celebrating 100 years ago, 100 years of library service now, because it's the tax-based library, not the, the 20 some years that the Tuesday Club ran it um, on donations and help from other organizations. But um, just wanna, you talk about how, um, 50 cents for every $1,000 of property was the valuation. So that's not very much money for even people then. And you think about Columbia was not that big of a town then. And this was actually still a town library, not a county library. But you see how it, um, lots of editorials and mailers to get out to the voters. And um, we'll see what the, the final vote was. And it passes. So in April of 1922, it passes from 962 to 319. So clearly there was a need for the library. And it also just happens to be that Mrs. Luella Wilcox St. Clair Moss also becomes a new school board member. So that's her first, that's her claim to fame as well as in April, 1922, she became the first woman on the Columbia Public uh, School Board. So there's the results right there. Um, a lot's changed in those first 25 years, those ladies working in it, or, or 23 years. Um, Mrs. Moss wins Democratic primary for Congress in August of 1922. So she actually actually runs for um, uh, the, um, a congresswoman in the district here in Columbia. 
but and she gets she gets all of Boone County and she gets several of the counties around, but unfortunately she loses in the fall. But here's a quote from her. It says, I entirely financed my campaign and I had no speakers paid or otherwise. The only assistance I had was that of my young friend, John Dalton, who drove my car and distributed literature. The result of the nomination, I consider an expression of true democracy, wherein no discrimination was shown on account of sex or previous condition of servitude. And of course, um, she was very well thought of in town, regardless. Um, she was just, she was just, um, the time she came here in 1893 till then, she was just, um, in those 30 years, she had a following that was just beyond reproach in this town because she was, she was so organized and so um, 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 active in all these groups. And that's the story of the women who are the founding mothers or the founding women of this organization that we now know as the Daniel Boone Regional Library in 1959, but the Columbia Public Library in 1922. And a special thanks to um, Nina and Katie.